Mains voltage LED tape, but this version has a linear cob strip in it, so it produces very diffused illumination along its length. I'm going to have to warn you in advance, just in case, this may have a bit of flicker because I'm about to turn this on and it is unsmoothed. So if I turn the dimmer on, I got the dimmer so we could take it apart too. Uh, initially, the strip comes on at a very low level, and as I turn it up, it's dead for most of the pot rotation, then suddenly it comes on and it's a bit flickery round about that point if you try turning it on, but it really doesn't dim that well. But you wouldn't expect that, given that it looks like they've used phase angle control, and that doesn't really suit the LEDs too much. So what we're going to do, I'm going to unplug this, then we're going to take, we'll, we'll open the plug as well, we'll open this unit, and we'll also strip a section of this, and we'll see what the construction's like inside. So let's start off with the plug and see how they put a fuse in it. They have. They've used... Oh, they've got the blue going to live, badly terminated. Oh, look at that. Look at that. That is just dire. That's not. How you terminate a plug in the UK, that is pretty bad. The blue and the brown are in the wrong terminals. doesn't really matter, I suppose, for an ungrounded item. But the, uh, the fuse here, let's get the fuse out. It's also not been terminated very well. It's very strandy. Now, this fuse, if it's a real fuse, should have sand in it. Let's uh, crack it open, see if there's sand. No, there's no sand in it. So it's a non-compliant fuse uh, and a non-compliant uh, wiring of the plug. Excellent. This is a good start. The case is just bulging open here. Let's uh, get back out here so you can see more of it. Uh, the knob just pulls off the front. Lovely. Pulling one's knob off. And it opens very easily to reveal what looks like a standard dimmer followed by a bridge rectifier. Um, oh, is it, it's the bridge rectifier going the input. That may be, and it might be a thyristor it's using for the phase algo control. We shall find that out when I reverse engineer it. The end bit is the usual thing that comes off fairly easy and is full with sticky stuff. I think this one's full of the sticky stuff. Well, this one might not be coming off easily. That's better. They're usually full of a gooey, sticky substance. No, this one looks as though it might be glued on okay. That's good. And this uh, thing, this connector here, is just clipped on. Can I unclip that? I think it'll probably unclip like that. And when we take it out, we can see it's just got two little metal tabs that seem to make a friction fit just against the uh, the LED tape inside. Interesting. Right, tell you what. I'm going to take some photos, reverse engineer it, and then we'll see what the circuitry looks like. One moment, please. The reverse engineering is done, but before we take a look at the circuitry, let's actually do what I should have done the first bit of the video and do an electrical test. And I've cut one meter off, and for safety, I've put the end cap in this end, and then just cobbled together a bridge rectifier and stuck it in this end, and we'll now stick it into the terminals of the hoppy. So this can be the dangerous end. Let's hope it doesn't pop off. Well, let's hope it does pop off. Uh, if I plug this in now, it lights up. No flicker. That's because the camera is compensating for that. Oh, it's so flickery. It is really unpleasant. Uh, it's showing 34 milliamps, a staggering 0.921 power factor. That's completely wrong. It's The Hoppy is misinterpreting this because it's not that good. Uh, and uh, almost 8 watts for this section. You can also see the outline of the, all the LEDs on the back of it. But a very diffused... Uh, a very diffused line in the front. I heard it popping and crackling there. That was a... Uh, my wiggly connections, that's a proper quality. Things worthy of note here. If you actually look down the end of this, and it is useful to know this, uh, you can actually see, particularly the magnifying glass or good eyes, you can actually see a wee plus and minus symbol on either side to, so you know the polarity. And it's interesting to note that the end termination had blue as positive and brown as negative. Uh, this is also copper-coated aluminium wire, which is just... Uh, I gave it the flame test and it just went all limp and crumbly and burst into flames. So that's good. Not really. But it's keeping with the quality of the product. So I have pulled a section of the strip out and done a bit of reverse engineering. Uh, so we'll bring in, initially, 
a picture of the LED tape. So I'll focus down onto that and zoom in a little bit. So this is a section. I'll just actually no, I'll just keep keep there. That's that's pretty good. We have the tabs at uh, the half meter sections, the twenty inch sections for connecting your rectified supply on. So here's the positive bus bar going along. Here's the negative bus bar. And it's using what are called flip chips. It's a little tiny LEDs that there's no package as such. It's the LED is engineered with a little tiny contact in the back of each chip. So they literally pick and place the bare LEDs onto this material and then seemingly flow sold them, or I'm not sure if they sold them or some other thing, but they are effectively sorted on. So we have sections of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight LEDs, and then a resistor. There's a resistor there. There's a resistor there. It's tapped off the bus bar at this end, and the LEDs are wired as pairs. Wired as pairs, and then those pairs are wired in series. We have 72 uh, parallel sections, 144 LEDs, and we've also got 18 resistors scattered along that. Um, so it taps on a positive at this end, goes through all the LEDs and resistors, and then goes on to the negative at the other end, and that just basically acts like a little string of Christmas lights, but in each half metre or 20 inches. The plastic channel, uh, this is it ripped open because I took the tape out of it, has the channel that the LED tape is fed in. I wonder how they do that. Uh, but it's fed in, and there's the dome of the phosphor, an area of sort of air to spread the light about, so it shines, diffuses through the distance, and then the final diffusing layer before the light comes out. And that's the sort of layer of gel that I basically peeled off by swiping a knife along this, so the LEDs probably didn't survive. Uh, this parallel circuitry is just a way of fitting more LEDs in a single circuit, but it also means that if one LED fails, it's not going to result in the whole string failing or a dark, too much of a dark spot, because the one next it will steal it. It's possibly just to cheat a little bit. Okay, let's take a look at the hideous dimmer. So the hideous dimmer looks like this. I shall zoom out. It has what appears to be a fuse. I thought it was a fusible resistor, but it's got an odd value. Orange, black, red, which would mean 3000 ohms. It's definitely not 3000 ohms, it's a dead short. That makes me think it's 3,000 milliamps, so it may actually be a fuse. I'm not sure about that. That would be 3 amps. Which, uh, this bridge rectifier is rated about 4 amps, so that kind of fits. There is a triac, a, a timing capacitor, a snubber network with a really oddly high-value resistor here. I wonder if they just use the standard circuit, and they just included it because EBDLs includes it. But in reality, if they'd used the 100-ohm resistor you'd normally use in something like this, uh, it meant would have meant that the LEDs would just not have gone out, even at the lowest setting, because uh, it just it would pass enough current to make them glow brightly. As it is, even with the 200k resistor, that section glowed visibly, and it was the current going through this capacitor and that resistor that was doing that. Very weird. Uh, standard uh, dimmer circuit with uh, the potentiometer and a hidden 10k resistor underneath, uh, charging this capacitor up until it reaches a threshold voltage or a diac, which is under here, and then it triggers the triac. The triac is a BTB04-600SL uh, sensitive gate triac. Um, 500k potential, there's the hidden 10k resistor, there's the diac. Uh, the twisty control has a switch on it as well, which breaks the connection here. There's a little snubber that goes between MT1 and MT2 of the triac. Uh, there's the gate being triggered by the diac uh, when the capacitor charges up. And there's the bridge rectifier. Noting that, uh, as I say with the cable, it was like it was the negative was brown and the positive was blue. Quite odd. And there's that mystery resistor component. Let's take a look at the schematic. Now, should we look at the LED first? I think we should. Two little schematics. Starting off with the LED strip just to show the rough construction, although I've pretty much described it. The 72 pairs of LEDs, I worked out probably, theoretically, around about 200 volts across those. The 1820 ohm resistors, based on the current AC kind of current, uh, the 2160 ohms 
we should have had 73 volts across it, but it's skewed by the fact it is not just a humpy rectified sine wave, but it's also only lighting at the top of that, as demonstrated by the dimmer just not working below that level. Here's the construction of those LEDs going in their little parallel pairs with the resistors, and that is them. As represent a circuit diagram, this repeated several times along the length. The eight LEDs as uh, four parallel pairs in series, and then the 120 ohm resistor. 8 watt, 34 milliamp, 0.925 power factor. The power factor cannot be believed in this instance. It's, it would be interesting seeing the waveform, but I can pretty much guess that it's just going to be at the top of the sine wave. It's lighting the LEDs because you have to exceed the combined forward voltage to make them light, which is odd. That's why this dimmer, when you turn it up, it just it's dead for most of it. And it's only when it can get high enough into the sine wave that the LEDs will light. Having said that, even because of the shape of the sine wave, let me draw a uh, sine wave. Oh, let's, uh, yeah, that's half a sine wave. Okay. Uh, if it was full wave rectified through this uh, bridge rectifier, the LEDs would be lighting up here. So maybe that is a fairly accurate. They'd be lighting at this uh, section here. So maybe in relative terms, that is faking the power factor because uh, it's only this small area in here that it can't really light. Um, so the neutral comes in and it goes through that switch. It then feeds one end of the triac, uh, which then switches it through to the rectifier. But the triac, the timing is controlled by this potentiometer and this uh, fixed value resistor to limit current if you screw the potentiometer to the far end. And on each, the start of each half of the sine wave, it starts charging up this capacitor. When the voltage reaches round about 30 volts, this diac suddenly conducts and dumps the capacitor into the gate of the track, turning it on. And when it turns on, it latches on. And say, for instance, you turned it on at the midpoint of the sine wave, it would stay on until the zero crossing point of the sine wave when the current, the polarity changes, the current goes to zero briefly, and the track just resets because these latch on until the current through them is reduced to zero. Then on the other half of the sine wave, it starts charging this capacitor again. And uh, once again, it, it charges it in the reverse this time because it is doing the AC. And once again, when it reaches the threshold across this capacitor that the DIAC triggers, it fires the triac again. Here's a snubber network. A snubber network is designed to just clip uh, sharp transients across the, most, the triac because if the triac, if you suddenly switch current across it very quickly, uh, like a spike or uh, common with inductive loads, it causes lots of problems, uh, it can actually falsely turn the triac on. So what they do is they put a capacitor across, usually 100 nanofarad with a 100 ohm resistor in series, and that just acts as a little uh, filter that just absorbs that spike because that spike has to charge that capacitor up before it can really affect the voltage too much there, and that stops the triac being mistriggered. When the track switches on, it feeds the AC end of the rectifier. The other end is fed via that mysterious 3 amp fuse, 3000 milliamp. I think that's what it is. And uh, that then gets rectified to put out the DC to the LEDs. It's very straightforward. It's not the best choice. So it's an interesting strip. Visually, it's quite robust. It's quite nice. It's a very linear stripe of light but the downside is that this stuff is because it's got no smoothing is very flickery but there is a hack you could do if you used a capacitive dropper uh, and uh, a current limiting resistor and smoothing you could actually for whatever length of run you just adjust the current to match because this will glow at very very low current so you could theoretically just create a little power supply that would run this at that reduced current and it would just have an ambient glow, something that's not too intrusive, something just gentle visual glow, uh, because it is fairly linear. It seems to be quite evenly lit along the, the full run. And that could last for a very, very long time. And if you use smoothing, it wouldn't have any flicker. I certainly wouldn't want to use this in a kitchen, which is probably where it will find its use with the sort of kitchen fitters putting them under the, the countertops um, and the, the cupboards above them. And that, uh, to me, that would the flicker would be very, very annoying because you'd see it out the side of your eyes. That sort of thing, you might not see it looking directly at it, but in your peripheral vision, which is designed to detect flicker, you'll see that strobing flickering, particularly in the UK because it does it at 100 hertz, uh, slightly higher frequency, 120 hertz in the USA. 
But that is it. It's interesting stuff. The construction itself is fairly nice. The dimmer is completely unsuited to it. They could actually have put the dimmer with a thyristor after the uh, the rectifier. They could have done that differently. But having said that, it's not great anyway. And the radio hams will hate the fact that it doesn't have any interference suppression. So it's going to create lots of electrical noise. But there we go. It's interesting stuff. But I don't recommend it. However, it was interesting to explore. It was quite interesting in that way.